So this is a 72 Nova that we actually have at the shop. We've been uh, kind of putting a bunch of different stuff on it and uh, we just figured we'd shoot a video for you so you can understand and know what all goes into installing one of these kits before you order yours. Or simply if you bought our drag racing kit and you're installing it step by step for the whole process. Hey guys, welcome back to the Motion Resource YouTube channel, also the TBM Brakes channel. Today we are installing a set of GM muscle car spindle, as we call them, brakes on our 72 Nova here in the shop. Now this is the same brake kit that is going to be used on 67 to 9 Camaros, uh, 68 72 Novas, and uh, anything with that same style spindle, which is very common in the 60s and 70s GM lineup of vehicles. So. Uh, this one has bone stock uh, spindles and the unique thing about this kit is it works for both a drum and disc style original spindle. If you're real familiar with this stuff, they're actually different between the two of them. So it is noteworthy to know that the same kit works for both of them. Now this kit uses our F1 style two piston front caliper. And this pairs perfectly with our F3 four piston rear caliper. So the reason why we put a two piston on our uh, brake kit is often asked to us um, but once we explain, it makes a lot of sense. A two piston belongs on a small contact patch like our front tire. Um, basically everything you learned growing up in shop auto class in terms of drag racing style braking is actually kind of a little bit backwards. So with a small contact patch, if we put a huge caliper on it, which we have options for, um, it's gonna just push that front tire. It's gonna, without a whole lot of weight behind it or on it, it's going to just uh, lock up the brakes and that's effectively not doing any good for your braking. So I put a real strong TBM four piston rear caliper on it with appropriate brakes because a lot of times what you see in a drag racing brakes world is that people will go ahead and put the same four piston front and rear and then take all the bias out of the front and put it to the rear with a proportioning valve effectively making the need for a four piston completely obsolete. So at that point you're carrying a bunch of weight and uh, you're counting on a proportioning valve to solve your problem. Typically on a 3,500 pound and under vehicle, we will put a two piston up front and a four piston out back. Now we currently have and are developing more medium duty style kits as we call them. We understand the need for 37, 3,800, 4,000 pound uh, vehicles to stop in a drag racing world. That was not a common thing in years past and is absolutely a common thing now. So we do have that for a variety of applications. So check our website out if that's something of interest to you. Another noteworthy thing is to know that this GM muscle car spindle is actually the basis for almost all aftermarket spindle mount style wheels. That GM pin is basically copied, derived, and applied to things like the AFCO and Strange style struts. Um, so this kit actually gives us a unique ability to make a spindle mount kit out of a stock style spindle. And what I mean by that is we've removed the hub completely. We can run a spindle mount wheel with the bearings built into it and just a caliper with the rotor bolted right to the wheel. That saves a ton of weight. It's not very common for people to want to use, but it is an option. So for this Nova, we have a two piston F1 style. We have a spindle mount DR1 style, which is also a two piston brake. And then we have a medium duty um, for those heavier vehicles that have a lot more demands as far as weight and speed. Now I'll go ahead and note that my gray uh, 72 Nova that I race on race week and drag week and sick week and everything, it weighs 3,400 pounds and goes about 194 in the quarter so far. That vehicle has driven through the mountains with a trailer, has gone those speeds, hundreds and hundreds of passes, and I've ran this same two piston style front brake up front. That being said, it's def definitely appropriate for a 3,400 pound car and under, um, and even up to a 3,500 pound car, I would uh, also run the same kit. I just wanna give you kind of like a real world scenario of this. The next caveat I want to give you is that with the TBM brakes, they're, they're built stronger, they're more rigid, and with the piston size we have built, if you're running this two piston up front and a four piston out back, we prefer you run a 15, 16 sport master cylinder. Now I know a lot of the aftermarket drag brakes on the market say run whatever master cylinder, don't even pay attention to it. 
and oftentimes if you have a four piston out front and a four piston out back you might run something like a 1032 or an inch and an eighth bore master um, those are going to give you a very spongy brake and will not achieve the adequate line pressure to operate these brakes in their best capability the 15 16 bore with a 7 to 1 pedal ratio is going to give you exactly the amount of pressure you want to operate these brakes and it's going to give you the best braking on the market period so if you're buying these two piston fronts definitely upgrade your master cylinder to that 15 16 bore and make sure you achieve the right pedal ratio i'll put a link down below to a diagram on how to measure pedal ratio properly so that you can get everything set up correctly on your right so this is just one half of the brake kit, but I didn't want the table to get too busy. Um, I'll tell you what's in it, that way you can understand what we're working with and what we have going on. So we have our F1 two piston caliper. This is a standard inch and three quarter bore uh, piston. The unique thing about our front two piston calipers is that they're really the only on the market, especially when it comes to a spindle mount wheel. Most brakes that look like this in the front are simply a pad on one side and a piston on the other side. They're a one piston caliper. Having two pistons on the front is humongous and it's not really offered by any other company. This is the strongest two piston caliper you'll find and it is absolutely a great option for this style application. Also in our kit is a hub. Now the unique thing about our hubs is they do not have a hat that goes on them after you put them together. The rotor bolts directly to the hub, thereby saving all of that weight that would normally be in a steel or aluminum hat. It makes these kits extremely lightweight but it doesn't sacrifice any type of stopping power or any type of rigidity. Also, you'll notice our hubs are very lightweight. Uh, we've scalloped the areas where they don't need to be there. Uh, we're not sacrificing any type of strength. As I mentioned, we've torture tested these things through the mountains, uh, hundreds and thousands of passes on them, and they're absolutely positively durable, strong, and fully capable. Also in our kit is this bracket for the GM spindles. As I mentioned, we have spacers so that when you buy this kit, it'll work on either a disc or drum style original spindle. Now you'll note in uh, this bracket, there's actually a recess for a speed sensor. We'll jump to that a little bit later, but one of the unique things about this kit is you can add a front wheel speed sensor. Super important on something that you're really getting critical with data, um, both in a uh, regular drag racing world as well as no prep. It's becoming super popular and we have a really unique solution that's really easy to use, compact, and uh, works really well. Also comes with is just your hardware. So let's just go ahead and jump to assembling the rest of this stuff before we go ahead and put it on a car. One of the unique things about the TBM drag brakes is that they're known for being no drag, which means every time you let off the pedal, the wheel spins just like you put it together with no pads. The reason for that is because the pistons actually come back into the caliper as soon as you let off the pedal. Now I know a lot of uh, our competitors out there are showing videos of theirs doing the same thing. They all do that the first time you put them together. The cool thing about the TBMs is that they do that every time you let off the pedal. Whether you've had a pass on your car or a thousand passes on your car. They retract the pistons and that gives a free momentum. This is important because it improves suspension dynamics. Of course a brake that's dragging is going to load up a car differently than one that's not. In addition to reaction time and ET, it's going to let the suspension do what it wants to do. If you're making changes against the suspension that's bound up or locked against brakes, it's going to react differently than a vehicle that is free moving and allowed to just do what it needs to do and roll easily. The best part about it is you can push the car around the pits, almost one person, one hand, whereas some of the brakes out there, including factory brakes, you're pushing with everything you've got and you're calling your buddies to help them push through the lanes as well. These use standard Timken bearings. A uh, question we get a lot about is what style grease we just suggest to use any type of premium molly style grease. Nothing uh, crazy or extravagant is needed to make these that have that no drag potential. The no drag concept is built into the caliper returning the pads, the style of hub that we're using, the setup, and everything else that TBM has to offer. Just a caveat, if you guys want to use a micro blue bearing, which is a uh, super lightweight, low friction bearing, which is a little bit more of a next step, but not necessary for a no drag, we can absolutely ship you these hubs without bearing. Just give us a call ahead of time and we'll make sure we leave the bearing races out of them, make your life easier, make micro blues life easier and easier to install. We also have seen customers in the past use ceramic bearings, although we do not uh, install ceramic bearings here we can do the same thing and leave the races out for you so that you can have them installed outside of TBM 
so let's go ahead and I'll go ahead and pack these uh, with grease and uh, we'll move on to the next step. These bolts actually come supplied in the rotor package, so they're not going to be part of your main hardware pack. They're going to be actually part of the bag that the rotor comes in. So the next thing we're gonna do is uh, go ahead and just put the bracket on the actual spindle. This is actually a factory disc style spindle. So you'll notice the spindle actually has this surface and this surface flat. So the bracket sits flat on it. Uh, there's another version of this spindle on the GM muscle car spindles that will require this spacer to make up because this surface is actually back this far. So um, luckily this one doesn't even need a spacer, which is even nicer. Uh, you're gonna use this 5 8 flathead cap screw on top and uh, half 13 on the bottom and that's going to go completely through the steering arm and uh, we're going to go ahead and put the supplied uh, nylock nut and flat washer on the back of this and crank everything down good again when you're mocking things up you want everything to be firm and in place so that your uh, whole base is able to be consistent um, so that if you do have to shim or offset the rotor you know that you're not trying to hit a moving target so this is an important step to note this is a good time to put your Hall Effect wheel speed sensor in here. It actually fits right in that slot, and then you use the supplied screw to secure it. If you have an older kit that doesn't have this, we can sell you just the upgraded bracket. Uh, you can just replace it right with what you have, and then buy our Hall Effect and wheel speed sensor, and these are all backwards compatible. So uh, that's pretty much how simple setting up the sensor is, and then you'll just use a supplied M5 cable to go up to uh, your wiring or a local Rife sensor block. Also, because you're replacing the actual hub in this kit, um, some of our brake kits do not. It comes with these half 20 studs, really nice studs, and they just simply screw right in the back of the hub, and then you can go ahead and tighten them down. They're 12 points, so they're easy to torque. Uh, just make sure you put some red Loctite on them before you finish putting them through. I'd prefer to run them down right towards the end and then put red Loctite on just at the end, um, but as simple as that. After red Loctite in, these are going to get torqued to 60 foot-pounds. This is actually something that's easier to torque when it's on the actual vehicle because you have a uh, steady and uh, easy to hold on to situation versus trying to torque it um, here, end up with a cut hand or just really struggling. Finally, the last thing that needs to be done is just go ahead and install the dust seal in the back of the hub before we put it on the car. So we'll go ahead and slide the hub right over the pin as you would with the factory one. Go ahead and install our front bearing. So a word to the wise, if you're not using the supplied Timken bearings, we've seen this before, um, things can get lost in translation. So a guy actually had an aftermarket set of bearings. Um, it was a specialty style bearing. He put everything together, put the seal on, uh, back seal, put everything on there spun it, good to go, put the car in trailer, loaded up, went to the track. He had this terrible vibration. What had actually happened was he had a false sense of security because the seal actually rides on a shoulder back there. So right now it would spin normally, the front bearing supporting most of it. But when he went to put the car down on it, um, the actual back bearing, the inner bearing was oversized. So that seal collapsed and it was riding on that loose tolerance. So then the car going on the track was just shaking the wheels. So always make sure you check aftermarket non-standard Timken bearings before you put the seal. Put the hub on, make sure it's all good to go, make sure it's supported, spins right, make sure the bearings are the right size, then pull it off, put the seal on, and put it back together. All right, so you go ahead and put your washer back on. No need to put a cotter pin in right now. Basically what we're gonna be doing is just checking our uh, caliper spacing, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, for the next step, basically what we're trying to do is make sure that the caliper is dead center in the middle of this groove. So that's going to give equal pad engagement and also allow for no drag. You don't really need pads in at this point. You can actually pretty much see it by eye at this point. 
whether it's going to be close enough and then from there we're going to shim the caliper to get it to this final position so we're going to use the supplied uh, 3 8 24 bolts and uh, just mop it up it's important to note that this actually uh, is a mock-up caliper that we use around the shop and it doesn't have any pistons in it so if you see it without pistons right now that's fine And again, just like any of the other steps, you want to go ahead and tighten these. Normally, you'd be putting a lock washer and a regular washer on these, um, but you don't want to tighten these, uh, or you want to go ahead and tighten these all the way down to make sure everything's snug. So you want to grab an Allen wrench just so you have repeatability, make sure everything's right. The one thing you want to look for on this setup is uh, making sure that these bolts don't go too far through where they're actually hitting the the rotor so we have a pretty good amount of clearance but on any of our kits we have two lengths of rotor bolts uh, you just want to make sure those are free and clear because obviously that can do some major damage of course you're going to take up more space with your washers when you put it together the final time so if it's looking good now uh, it should look good then as well so you can actually see the cool thing about is this parting line is a good reference point so you can actually see if that uh, lines up on the rotor see it's actually a little bit to the outside as far as lineup but that goes in our favor because now we can shim the caliper back uh, but overall it's quite close so i don't even think we're going to work on we're not even going to switch the rotor around as far as uh, whether it's flip-flopped on uh, the recessed area or not we're actually going to use the caliper shims which we're only talking about probably a 20 or 30 thousand shim we'll get it perfect and uh, then we'll be all set Another important thing to make, make note of is to make sure your bleeder is actually at the top portion of the caliper. This is gonna make it easier to bleed because it's the highest point, so this is where we're gonna bleed air from. And then obviously your three ends on the bottom. When you buy a set of TBM brakes, you're gonna get two, a mirror of each caliper, or a mirror of this caliper. So you're gonna get one uh, with it here and one with it here. Obviously the other one's gonna go on the other side because it's gonna be flipped completely 180 degrees. So. Before you start bleeding, make sure that your calipers are oriented correctly. Uh, it'll save you a lot of time and headache as far as bleeding goes because nobody likes to bleed, bleed brakes, at least nobody I've ever met. So from here, we're going to use our supplied shims. Uh, we give you a pretty wide variety of uh, thicknesses. I think there's a 10 thousandths and a 30 thousandths. We're going to grab a couple 30 thousandths and I think we'll be spot on the money. So I actually like to loosen up these uh, calipers one at a time. Um, and if you just loosen them up a little bit, it's easier to just slide the shim in between the bolt on each one each time. Um, that way you're not trying to put them both on with a shim in at the exact same time. So I just go ahead and do it like this. And if it's loose enough, you can just go ahead and start it back again. It's important when you are servicing this car that you throw these shims in your trailer or wherever you're gonna be working on it because if you lose one when you're taking it apart, it's super frustrating. All right, you guys, you can actually see it's perfectly dead center. So at this point, what we're gonna do is take everything back apart, red Loctite everything. Um, it's a good time to also check your brake line. Um, if you don't have it, we have a whole line of adapter fittings and hoses in stock, so it's a good time to grab those. But uh, yeah, go ahead and take everything apart. We're gonna Loctite it, put lock washers on, and uh, finalize this thing. So important note, this will be in the instructions that you get with the brakes, but these uh, rotor to hub bolts are going to be torqued to 15 foot pounds. Make sure you put red Loctite on them. If for some reason you actually have aftermarket uh, spindles, this is a good time to check clearance. We like to see between the rotor tip and the caliper somewhere between 80 to 100 thousandths of clearance. Uh, we've seen it get by at 70 thousandths, but there's going to be some thermal expansion that happens. So the last thing we want is this rotor running into 
this caliper. If for some reason your setup has an aftermarket spindle and it doesn't have this type of clearance, uh, please let us know and we'll see what we can do to help you um, get through that whole situation. Uh, there's a lot of different aftermarket spindles out there. Some of them look like they're stock spindles, but we just always like to have a uh, secondary look at that situation. All right, so um, everything is Loctited, torqued. Um, we're gonna go ahead and put our dust cap on. We've put our cotter pin in on the end. Um, of course, set it like you would any bearings. This cap screws right on and has an O-ring. It's very nice for field service. You don't have to try and pry it off with a screwdriver. The nice thing about the TBMs is that our pads are field serviceable. You can almost do it with the wheels on the vehicle. Uh, because they come out the top, we have this unique holding pin. You can go ahead and just start the pin, slide the first pad in, second one, and you're done. Last thing you wanna do is put the supplied screw back in here. Make sure you tighten it properly. Might even not even, might not even be a bad idea to put some blue Loctite on it and uh, just snug her down and you're all set. So a couple of quick caveats. Because these are 60s and 70s spindles and they were never designed to have high precision race brakes on it, you can actually see that the pin versus the mounting pad for the actual spindle the rotor is actually coming at a slight angle. It's not, it's hard to even see on the video. Um, that's something that you're gonna deal with on any brake. We actually supply these shims for the top and the bottom. Not only do you want the rotor centered this way to this way in terms of the caliper, but you don't want the caliper this way or this way. Uh, basically what that's gonna do is create a situation where when the pistons come out, they get cocked in the bores and uh, that can lead to premature caliper failure, uh, binding, all that different stuff. So you wanna make sure things are square, or not only spaced this way, but they're square this way as well as this way. So basically a good thing to do is check all of that. Uh, if you have uh, measuring tools, cool, but you can actually eyeball it on most setups. Um, so it's always good to get it dialed in as perfectly as possible. And that's gonna ensure that the longevity and the, uh, uh, the durability of the calipers are going to be there just like you would expect from the first time till five, 10 years down the road. So I've talked about in a few of our videos how durable and how long these pads last because they don't drag the uh, actual material last so substantially longer than uh, any drag brake I've used in the, hit in the past as well as the rotor itself. A pad uh, is good till about a hundred thousandths material left. So it's got a hundred thousandths or so material. It's a good time to switch them out. Um, also with our brakes, we want you to use a DOT 5.1 brake fluid made by us. It's called Extreme 6 brake fluid. We do this not because uh, we want to sell it to you, but because we've already ensured the compatibility. The nice thing about this fluid is it is compatible with three and four. So the lines and the system doesn't have to be exactly drained. Um, you can of course use three and four, but it's not gonna be rated for the temperature and the extreme use that you're gonna put these things through. Grab three or four quarts of our Extreme Six brake fluid when you're uh, putting this all together and you'll be happy. This actually, this kit's actually gonna run our number one pad. It's a standard compound. It is exactly what I run in my 194 mile an hour Nova that I take on Rocky Mountain Race Week and drag race hundreds of passes a year. It's a great pad for doing both. It lasts a long time, uh, it handles the heat, and it stops the car really well. We have in the past had an aggressive 85 compound pad, but I'm willing to not really give it to almost anybody anymore. It's very aggressive, um, has, causes a lot of damage to rotors prematurely if it isn't brought up to extreme temperatures. It has a ceiling and a uh, operating temperature that's way higher than most cars will ever put brakes into, especially if you have any sort of dual purpose. When you put these brakes on, a couple things that you can expect. As I mentioned, you're gonna have the free spin on and on and on. Um, the bearings don't need service any more often than they normally would on any other uh, brake with a bearing. Um, as far as the actual pads go, when you initially start using them, it's gonna take about seven to 11 thousandths of pad material off of the pads instantly. Of course, you wanna clean the rotors when you first start um, with brake clean. Um, from there, you're gonna see some pad buildup. That's basically pad transfer. So that's exactly what you want to see. Um, you're gonna see some color get put into this areas right here. These rotors do an extremely good job of controlling temperature. They're gonna stay flatter longer because of their shape. They're dispersing heat and equaling it out across the surface of the rotor. None of these things are things to be worried about. 
So if you take a rotor hone to it, you're gonna knock the material off it and give it a fresh surface, which is or isn't advisable. Some people do it, some people don't, but then you're gonna have to have a new pad transfer to get going. So the most pad life that you're ever usually gonna take off of a pad is on initial new setup. Also, the pads inherently are free floating. That's kind of the concept of the no drag. So initially you're gonna hear a little bit of the pads clanking around. They're gonna be moving back and forth um, because they're not sitting right on the rotor. On a traditional uh, aftermarket caliper, a lot of times the pads are dragging so you don't hear the pads clanking around. It's not really anything to be worried about and it's not really anything that crazy. Um, it's not really anything that disturbing as, like, as far as hearing, but it is different than what you normally hear. Lastly, these rotors have their own pattern. So when they go by the pads, the first time you go down the track, you're gonna hear a little bit of a hum when you're coming to a stop. You're gonna to learn to love this sound, but it's different than the normal uh, brake noise that you hear. Uh, the resonance of the shape of the rotor just creates that unique TBM sound. Just something to be aware of before you make your first passes down the track or put these things to use for the first time. Anyways, guys, make sure you red Loctite everything. Check nut and bolt your car, just like you would with any other part of the car. This is a racing vehicle, creates vibration. Make sure you torque everything, make sure you red Loctite everything and just do a good job of keeping up with your maintenance as far as checking nuts and bolts as far as tightness. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope it made your install easier at home or gave you a little bit of an insight on what you're up against when you go to install this on your vehicle. Everything you need for this kit is absolutely in this kit when you get it. If you have questions, give us a call. Until next time, we'll see you guys later.